Hello, everybody. Welcome here today. Um, we're excited to uh, have our final installment of the Honoring Our Mother speaker series. And um, I'd like to start off this program tonight with a land acknowledgement. So the University of Manitoba campuses are located on the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and the mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Um, and we'd also like to acknowledge that this speaker series has been funded um, by the Student Innovation and Enrichment Fund. And so today we introduce to you Indigenous placekeeping, popularity, and futurities. Uh, Wanda de la Costa is a member of Satellite Cree Nation. She's a practicing architect and professor at Arizona State University. She's a director and founder of the Indigenous Design Collaborative, a community-driven design and construction program which brings together tribal community members, industry, and multidisciplinary team of ASU students and faculty to co-design and co-develop solutions for tribal communities. De La Costa holds a Master's of Design Research and City Design from SCI ARC and a Master of Architecture from the University of Calgary. Uh, Selena Martinez uh, is a member of the Pasquayaki tribe and um, was born and raised in Phoenix, Arizona. She completed her Master of Architecture degree from the Arizona State University in 2020 and is currently pursuing her architectural license. She has been involved in a diversity of projects with local tribal nations through the ASU Indigenous Design Collaborative. Selena is the co-founder and lead instructor um, for Design Empowerment Phoenix, a program uh, of the Sagrido Galleria in South Phoenix that creates opportunities for youth and community to engage in design tools and processes. And so with that, uh, I'm excited uh, to hand it over to Selena and Wanda. Thank you so much. And that, what a beautiful land recognition. That was really, really just a wonderful, one of the best I've heard in a long time. So thank you for that. And I just happened to look at the, at the there, and I see a number of familiar uh, names in this list. So a shout out to all of my fellow graduates from the UFC um, program and colleagues that we work with across Canada. Very nice to see familiar faces and names on this uh, call. So today we wanted to share with you a few concepts that we're thinking through and we thought we hope um, that they begin to also draw associations for you uh, in your work. Apologies, there's a lot of wind here in Phoenix right now. Um, and you can hear the wind blowing in our, in our home. But what we wanted to do, and I guess it's fitting, is that we're drawing a connection between the concepts we're working through and our natural world. Uh, and so I wanted to share with you to start where we are right now in physically in our geography. So you see the arrow that's pointed um, to the, the state of Arizona. And you'll notice that the colored portions on the map are all of the reservation boundaries here in the US. So all of the colored portions on that map represent reservations here in the US. And so you can see that in Arizona, we're in a really dense area. And the beauty, if you can flip to the next slide, what that brings being in Arizona, not only are we home to 22 tribes, but we have 55,000 indigenous youth in the pipeline that could potentially come to the university and study architecture. You know, So it's a very, very dense place. We have 3,000 indigenous students at ASU. And what that brings is 52 native design students. So that people ask me, well, how, how did you end up in Arizona? And this is the reason we have such an incredible density down here that it's um, a really beautiful place to try and teach and examine and explore this topic. Next slide, thank you. Our vision at the IDC is really just this. It's about preparing our next generation. Um, we call them, uh, you know, I think we're in a bit of a, a transformation in our field right now and I think the, um, the people who graduate from our program at ASU end up becoming ambassadors. It's a new way of thinking about architecture and I think it's transformative. And so we call them field transformation ambassadors. 
and they're working at the intersection of place, design, and culture. Our mission is to not only increase the understanding and inclusiveness, but also the accuracy. I think um, there are so many things that need to be illuminated and that remain invisible about our cultures and our communities, and they're undervalued and underexamined. You know, the worldviews and the value systems. And I think they really offer a beautiful lens toward uh, a new type of uh, transformation that we're hoping to achieve. So with that, I think this, um, this um, work that we'll share with you today aims to sort of enlarge those connections. What you see on the screen now are some of our worker or some of our um, staff at the IDC. We have a couple of faculty uh, so far, myself and another. Uh, Claudio Vexting, who helps uh, in, our pro, in our design and supervising the students, as well as a number of interns that change every year. Uh, we do have a program manager, uh, Tira Miller, and of course, a rotating group of students. Next slide. So our first concept that we want to talk about is placekeeping. So for us, people often ask, you know, one of the questions we're often asked um, is, what is placekeeping and how does it differ from a, a very important concept that people often talk about, which is creative place making. And for us, I think there's a critical distinction. Uh, and for us, it's that we connect to um, the citizen experts or the lived experience of the local Indigenous communities in a really, really deep way. Uh, it's about connecting to local value systems and assets of these communities that I think have also been undervalued over time. We really uh, deep dive into Indigenous ways of knowing, being, connecting, doing, and um, the process that, is, that allows us to enlarge all of those understandings. And that we look at architecture, not so much in terms of that bright, shiny object, but really about uh, how we can measure outcomes, positive outcomes, holistic outcomes through the act of architecture. Next slide. So let me take you through a, just a small sampling uh, of, of how we work through each of these four parts. So the first part, community-led, and you see a number of pictures on screen. We do small engagements, we do large engagements. We bring our knowledge brokers into the, into the class, into the studio, um, into all parts of our work. This is really, really important, uh, important concept because um, without the local perspectives, um, we would, I think, really be amiss in capturing that connection to place. You know, um, many of our explorations revolve around um, what we call a storied landscape. So when we think of the land and all the stories that exist on that land, those illuminate so many vital um, connections that we're aiming to build in architecture. And without the community, it would really be impossible to kind of um, get to that level. Next slide. Um, in terms of process, um, what's vitally important, I think, in terms of our work is really um, stepping back um, from, I think, you know, we've often talked about de decolonialization, colonial processes, Western processes, that we're really trying to move aside and move around. Um, and for us, I think that it's really exploratory. You know, here, what you're seeing on the picture on the screen is we decided to move uh, our studio out to the reservation for a day to see if it would be different. What if we worked really, really deeply in place with the people of the place? And so we actually did a live uh, in real time design studio where the students were doing 3D modeling live and the community members were sharing their views of the place, the important associations to the landscape, um, worldviews, belief systems, and all of the life ways that they wanted to bring um, back into thinking about the built environment. They were sharing that with us live and telling us to, to alter our architecture based on these ideas. So it was a, it's a very interactive process that we're aiming towards. So that's just one example. The third uh, part of our placekeeping framework is about the notion of place base. What you see on the screen, uh, many people don't know, but in the city of Phoenix, for those of you that um, have, have been to this part, there is a river that runs through um, Tempe Town Lake, they often refer to it. It's a, it's a man-made um, water body that exists in the middle of Phoenix, and it's dammed at 
you know, multiple portions. But what we didn't know and what we learned by working really closely in association with the local people of this place, that image you see on the top row, the, um, the life ways of the people who used to use the river to not only um, obtain water, um, the food sources that would come there, the animals that used to occupy that space and the medicines that would come through there. And those three on the top level are the histories that come from this place that is Phoenix that have been dammed. And now it's a series, you see the canals on the lower level. This is one of the smaller canals, but there are larger canals that you, there are very few signs of mother earth um, within these canals. And so for us, it's really about reconnecting to those ancestral lifeways that are tied to this landscape. And you see a picture of, of a knowledge broker, um, a citizen expert, um, someone with a lived experience of this land, sharing those stories and those learnings from the land. Next slide. And finally, the last part of our framework is really about um, this notion of reciprocity. I think our work as architects, you know, when we think of it, um, what value, when we kind of reposition it and think about what value we're bringing to the local community, you know, besides, you know, architects are often trained, as you know, to, you know, win awards and collect accolades and, you know, create the, the, the brightest and the shiniest object that would make it into a magazine. But I think that is probably our last goal in terms of the work that we do. It's really about how are we actually providing value and how can we measure the value with our communities? So in part of our work right now is we're looking at not only you know, getting the firsthand uh, narrative from our communities and as to what's important with every project, but how these projects can actually give back. You know, sometimes we'll, um, well, often we involve youth. Um, a lot of our processes involve this sort of notion of integrating youth so we can actually introduce this profession to the next generation. Uh, sometimes we'll work with local master builders, those who understand the local traditional techniques, so we can involve them in the construction process. Um, just any way that we can actually reconnect and bring that connection to the local community and provide actual value is really what we're after. A beautiful picture of a woman holding up the water, a, a young girl holding up the water. It's a very um, strong picture for us. So we brought a case study and we're, we're trying to illuminate today with a series of case studies that we think um, articulate really the, the, the placekeeping notion in this case. And so with this, I think the best project that we can um, share with you, we did a campus indigenization project at ASU. You know, this is the largest public university in the US. So it's a very large place. We have four campuses. And when I moved to Phoenix, um, I've, I've been here about five years teaching now. When we moved here, there was very little, um, there was very little visible recognition of the indigenous communities here. You know, many people who are from this region, we talk about, they have some symbols on the freeways when you drive by. Uh, but other than that, I didn't see architecture. I didn't see signs of um, that any culture had lived here, you know, for longer than, you know, a hundred or so years. And so for us, it was really important to begin to kind of step back and think, how can we actually bring value to our campuses, to the students of this campus? And so we uh, gathered a group of Indigenous students and we asked them to ideate. There are many of them were from Arizona, most of them except for one. We asked them to ideate different um, ideas for designing on campus. And it could be anything from um, meditation spaces to underground growing um, centers like horticultural centers underground to uh, places to um, connect to artwork on campus to even furniture. And so we did a number of um, ideations. There were 16 proposals in total. We ended up giving the book, we created a, a monograph, which is an important part of this work to be able to communicate outward and share the ideas and share your process and how you got to those ideas so that other people can think about it and perhaps emulate um, the process, the exploration that we went through. And what we did is we gave that book to the president of uh, ASU. He loved the ideas in there and now it's fantastic. So every time he um, you know, uh, needs to connect and sort of build those connections to this place and this region, 
he goes through the book and commissions one of these ideas from the book. So next page or next slide. This was one of the ideas from the um, that came that emerged out of this this exploration, and it's a table where we work with a local artist, and a lot of our work is done with local artists, and we reimagined um, using the stories from a, a, a fellow that works in local metals. His name is Jeffrey Fullwilder. He's a really incredible artist, but he had this idea of exploring the notions of the baskets, which are of course very significant. They connect to Mother Earth. You know, they're built from the, the beautiful assets um, that come from Mother Earth, but they all have stories and they all have designs. And he talked about a table and it's a huge table that will be situated in the Labriola space of ASU's main library, the Hayden Library, where indigenous, all of the indigenous uh, literature is placed. So indigenous students will be able to sit at this table and study indigenous topics in a plate in a on a piece of furniture that is designed by people from the local area connecting to everything about um, that is phoenix next slide and also in the same library project we also um, wanted to really um, bring home the idea of belonging and welcoming you know a lot of these um our institutions such as universities are very far from you know, our, our norms at times, I'm a first generation student, you know, the university was an extremely odd place. And I'm sure uh, many of you can attest to this. And it's a very foreign place. It's, you know, your people aren't everywhere. And how do you make people feel welcome? And so for us, it was about bringing all of the indigenous greetings from Arizona, bringing three wonderful artists, very, very well-known artists, um, from this region and beyond, um, outside of Arizona as well, who have um, um, a special way of, of, you know, a graffiti um, calligraphy that they all bring. And they wrote traditional greetings. And we uh, place these in the library to greet students as they come into the school. Next slide. I'll pass it over to Selena. Thanks, Wanda. Um, so this concept of plurality really came to us from this book called Designs for the Pluriverse by Escobar. And um, we really started to use this as a way to, you know, understand that there are many and more than one types of cultures. So the whole concept of the pluriverse is a world where many worlds fit. And uh, you know, the lifestyles pre-contact were explicitly interconnected with our relationships to the environment. And we held this historical localization in place and nature. And, you know, a metaphor for what the pluriverse is, is really like climates, the different types of climates that we have within our world, within, you know, all these diverse ecosystems and how divergent they are to each other. So, you know, there's a bunch of different indigenous populations that exist and continue to survive here um, within North America. And we see this vibrancy of traditions. And at some point um, during colonization, these were reduced to being worth nothing, unfortunately. And it was, this reduction of worth was really just dehumanization. And it began to classify peoples according to their value to the interests of, um, at least in our context, the United States. And within that book, the Pluriverse book, they talk about this idea of defuturing design. So basically this means where the future is sacrificed for the hollow gains of the present, basically in the name of progress. So, um, I think now, you know, all over we're seeing or we're in this territory of struggle and there's all these different, you know, literal and metaphorical fires everywhere that we're trying to extinguish and alleviate um, due to these disruptive outside patterns on our cultures and communities. Um, and this can look like, you know, urbanization, modernization, globalization, um, the extraction of resources, um, for these cities that are taking from the land in our territory. Uh, this is another quote from the book. The territory is our life 
and life is not sold, it is loved and defended. Um, our territory is our true history book. It's a living entity of memory and it holds knowledge, sacred sites, seeds, rituals. And you know, this continuous expo exploitation of land has generational impacts that we have been filling and continue to fill. So I think, you know, at this point or this uh, reflection point, you know, we're all trying to seek a life of autonomy for our nations and communities and to be less dependent on the dominant society. And, you know, this idea of plurality really uh, gives way to understanding that our world is filled with, you know, infinite diversity that we often don't acknowledge it, all acknowledge because it's typically, you know, these worldviews and realities become suppressed due to um, their differentiation from the status quo. And um, these worldviews can, are very complex and the way that we've begun to understand them through the lens of plurality and through some of Sean Wilson's work um, and his explorations, you know, with research of ceremony and those different ways of being, ontology, epistemology, axiology, methodology. The way that we're trying to uh, redefine this is through ways of being, ways of knowing, as the process of relationships that shape our realities, along with indigenous values and ways of doing to maintain and be accountable to these relationships. And, you know, our these concepts and indigenous worldviews are sometimes very unthinkable from the perspective of Eurocentric theories and approaches and methodologies. So um, with ways of being, you know, this, some of the terms that we have here are in relation, place-based, ceremony, storytelling, and obviously the list can go on. But I think one of the main examples of that are our emergent stories. Um, and how those are really, um, you know, obviously they're dependent on who's telling them and they vary depending on who's telling them, but I think they hold a lot of the ancestral values and um, really illustrate our relationship to our environment. The ways of knowing, this can look like a variety of different knowledges. Um, one of the resources we often look to is Gregory Cajete and how he kind of begins to explain these four ways of accessing knowledge. So contemporary, where we're gaining that through experience, education, and problem solving. Empirical, which is gained through careful observation and practice over place. And we often see this as the place-based knowledge and you know those people who continue to maintain that relationship over time and have that observation and practice for generations. The revealed way of gaining knowledge. So that could be through vision, ritual, ceremony, um, traditional, handed down based on stories and experience of, experiences of people through time. And I think what this is really alluding to is, you know, the different ways of learning uh, about the world and accumulating knowledge um, and sometimes not all of these are, you know, um, validated by our academic institutions. Indigenous values as well um, are part of that and that's connected to, you know, the intention, um, an organic feeling, holisticness, a balance, um, I would even say interconnectedness um, and how we begin to understand the complexity of all of these indigenous values and how interconnected they are. And also like very interdisciplinary ways and approaches to um, explaining these values and utilizing these values as metrics. Ways of doing, um, this can look like, you know, a, a community's protocol, uh, a reciprocal relationship, process-based, community-led. And I think we're in a time now where, you know, there's a lot of indigenous academics and indigenous people within these industries creating new frameworks and methodologies on how we can um, approach this work better and create more meaningful projects for our communities. And I think this, you know, kind of 
continues on to the fact that there is a relationship between design and culture and that the that design can help us better practice our culture and um, evolve these cultural meanings into our everyday lives and our um, and a variety in a variety of different capacities and scales. One of the examples from my own tribe is actually uh, one of our ceremonial dancers. It's called the Yaki Deer Dancer. And all of his regalia is connected to our homelands in Sonora, Mexico, and how we utilize the different species within our environment to um, help us further that connection to not only our emergent stories, but you know our connection to nature and how we utilize those different species. And I think what the pluriverse really you know, gets at is that acknowledges that we are all interconnected as human species. And we see, th see this through concepts of ancestrality, autonomy, and futurality. And I think really what this work we're trying to do is reconnect those generations through perspectives like the seven generations and how we connect our past, present um, situations into the future and how we move that information and begin to combine and create these more interdisciplinary approaches. Um, along with that, you know, indigenous diversity um, has a different or various kind of uh, approaches or explanations. So I, I think Wanda, maybe you want to talk to this one a little bit. Uh, and so this, this is a definition that came out of the United Nations. And I think it's something that we often um, use to teach through. And I think because it's such a broad definition. So um, if you look at this list, and I often tell people, you know, look at this and how many people does it represent around the world? And I think of all of the indigenous communities, you know, think broadly about indigeneity. I think of the, our groups in South America. I think our, I think of indigenous groups in Asia, in, um, in India. And I think when you start to look at this list, it's a really broad definition of indigeneity. And I think that the key point for us when we think about this definition is really number seven, is that it, they resolve all the people, whether you're in Dubai and you know, your, your world is being changed dramatically by the, 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 the pace of development. But the idea is that many people around the world want to maintain and reproduce ancestral environments and the systems that they represent as distinctive, you know, people and communities. And I think that's really, really important concept because to me, the more of us that can band together and really vibe for those localized and place-based understandings, I think the richer and the more, um, more exciting our environments become, right? I, you know, many people know that I, I've traveled all my 20s, I backpacked around the world and I, I saw this sort of beauty that existed everywhere. You know, not just in North America, but there's this beautiful um, connections to be built with cultures from all over the world. And I think we do a disservice when we, um, when we don't think, when we don't take the time to really delve into that. So this, that's what this definition is always represents for me is that, you know, we're inclusion in this larger movement that's happening around the world. Oh, Juan, did you want to start sure. from this one? Yeah, so this is a con this is a, another notion that we're we're finding a lot of um, a lot of um, really deep exploration in is this notion of futurity. So it was coined by a woman, Dr. Grace Dillon. Um, she teaches, I believe, out of the Portland um, State University, and it the definition is that. Indigenous futurity is a past future visions where we construct self-determined representations and alternative narratives about our identities and our futures. So the, the sources that you see online there, the video and the CBC podcast, these are phenomenal resources. So go and um, tap into them because it's a really rich, um, a really rich um, concept that we're exploring right now. Next slide. It's being done in a series of, of creative, uh, creative methods from um, architectures where we're, we're trying to apply it. 
Um, I haven't quite seen it done in architecture yet, but it's done a lot in gaming, in a lot of um, visual arts. Um, where else have I seen it employed? Uh, in video. And then I think the closest association that you might be able to connect to is um, everyone who remembers Wakanda from the movie Black Panther and that sort of futurist future vision that was created that the environment didn't look like anything. Um, it was connected to the people of that place, the symbols, the regalia that they wear, everything that they wore, everything about that place of Wakanda related to the people and their aspirations and what what they thought was important for their future. And I think this is what we're really aiming to do. The couple of, uh, there's a couple of groups doing great work that we want to just flag so you can explore. This one is called indigenousfutures.net. Um, so go ahead and take a look at that one. The second one is cultural organizing. And that again has broad uh, groups of indigeneity represented within this and or broad groups of culture represented in the cultural organizing. So have a look. It's a really powerful concept that I think um, is kind of game changing. Yeah, and I think it also, you know, when you think about futurities, it's almost like dreaming and uh, thinking about how we could have a multiverse or a pluriverse of worlds um, within a world. So um, I think that can stem from these ideas about communal dreaming and how we begin to use this as a method to envision what our community wants and use that visioning as tools to um, have these conversations at these tables with the people making these decisions about our communities and how we begin to use design as a tool to situate ourselves um, within these larger conversations. And uh, it's definitely can be a catalyst for redefining our relationship to reality. You know, just putting, you know, a seed out there, getting feedback from people. And then, you know, even if one aspect of that vision is able to be implemented, that is a win for the community. And uh, I think we just need to begin to put out these alternative ways of being. And obviously there's a wide spectrum of what this looks like. You can define it as speculative design. It can be critical design, you know, even like science fiction-y. Um, there's a lot of different areas of how to see this type of futurity envisioning. And so one of the last um, projects that we've done, I think really represents um, the notion of futurity. So this was done, there were three indigenous architects that came together. Um, it's a project that was across from parliament in Canada. So it's a very, um, a, a very special site. Um, and I joke often, this is the colonial building up in the top right hand corner that they gave us to create um, the Indigenous um, building out of. And after the, our three Indigenous architects wiped the tears off our drafting board that we were given a colonial building <laughs> to redesign, we got to work at um, imagining how we would convert um, that old structure into something that related to our culture. And what you see on the screen is something, it looks quite bold and it looks quite progressive and we did it on purpose. You know, we wanted, it's, it's embedded with layers and layers of meaning, and I'll share with you how we connected to those layers of meaning. But I think the purpose of this, we realized that it's going, you know, this could be 10 years before they actually build anything on the site. And it was more important for us um, to create a bold concept that would get the attention and that would speak to all the communities across Canada um, and, and really make a statement that we are still here and that we might not look or represent what, um, the architecture that you think um, that we should we should resemble. You know, we wanted it to be a little bit shocking, so that was kind of the aim with this project. Next slide. You'll see here the site. Um, there's your par our Parliament building in Canada, and directly across. Although we didn't have that green parcel where the sacred fire is located, we asked if we could borrow that parcel for this concept because it was important for us to represent the sacred fire, which is truth, which is about a dialogue, it's about a conversation. And we wanted to have, um, have that articulated as a really important, you know, because we were talking about the government relations between um, the Canadian government and our First Nations, Métis and Inuit communities and the Algonquin territory 
uh, ancestors of the region. And so our solution was really about um, how do we make a place that begins to rebuild that relationship. Next slide. Our team, there you see um, Aladia Smoke, who is from the region, an Indigenous architect, David Cortan, who is a graduate, we graduated together. And of course, the vital, most vital member of our team, our elder, Winnie. Um, she, I often share that um, she played such a pivotal role in this work that um, it, would, it would be almost impossible to imagine the work not proceeding with her voice. And I'll share with you a little story from her involvement as we get into the next few slides. So our inspiration, you know, as always with all of our architecture, is really about connecting to um, natural concepts, ancestral concepts, uh, life ways, uh, material culture, worldview, everything that we can find that would bring meaning. And in this case, you notice the many layers of meaning that we built in, in the exterior of that building. It, we started with the wigwam. Do you see the multiple layers that are in that, that beautiful structure that is the wigwam? There's an inner and outer structure and then this sort of wrapping. We went from there to think about textures and birch bark and the, the history of the region of birch bark biting and the, all of the um, beautiful visuals that are created through this art form. And then of course, we have to always consider our Métis groups. They're often, we've heard multiple times that they are the ones that feel left out. They're often forgotten when we think about First Nations in Canada. And so we wanted to make sure to capture that sash um, that you'll see that sort of wrap that goes around the building and that is a reference to that sash. And then finally, we created these layers on the outside. Some people think of them as feathers, other people see snowshoes, um, other people see, um, there's different associations embedded feathers and um, whatever you pick up, um, the idea with all of those, um, I guess you could call them ornaments that sit on the outside of that building, is that each one would represent one of the communities in Canada, noting that, you know, we're not all the same, we're all very diverse, and we want everyone in on that face of that building to be recognized. Next slide. So when we zoom in, you see the, the articulated um, expression dedicated to each one of our communities in Canada. You know, it's not only that we are still here, it's that we are still here, and there is a lot of diversity within that. You'll see the forms, you know, one, the, one, um, the diagram on the right is the roof plan and the diagram on the left is, is somewhere um, lower in the building, but you see the organic nature of these forms. And this is something that we're finding, you know, as we're talking about mother nature and mother earth, or nature and mother earth, these associations to the, the natural world seem to be really prevalent in all of our work these days. You know, everyone is asking us to move away from the, the rigid corners and the rectilinear forms. And you, as you know, as architecture students and faculty, it's a challenge to build forms that are organic. They are uh, more complex. They think um, you have to detail them in a different way, in a really thoughtful way, and they can add a, add a price to it. But, you know, I've often told uh, the clients that I'm not sure that there is a price to um, a square versus an organic building when it comes to building cultural associations. I'm not sure we can put a price tag on that. Next slide. This is the, the from Winnie, um, the beautiful elder that was with us throughout the entire um, project. She shared this beautiful um, insight as we were working through what would happen inside that building and she said well what about she says I know this is a city but what about the people that you know that aren't in a suit that aren't working in that building how do we make it inclusive for them can we add a soup kitchen in the middle of this um, public building and so she you know the, the values that that represented this spirit of generosity inclusivity and sharing those value systems become really, really, I think, differentiators and, and really distinguish what Indigenous architecture is really aiming toward. And then, of course, um, a space for lifeways. What you see on the screen are two gathering areas. The one on the right is the one that we hijacked, the site that we hijacked and said we needed to create a sacred fire, a path of reconciliation to the Canadian Parliament, it's a place, of course, to come together to dance. Uh, gathering, as you know, is, is critical to uh, much of what we do in our 
indigenous world and our, our practices. And then what you see on the left is another gathering space. Um, there were a series of these in the building. Um, and this one looks up, looks out over the parliament. And so this to us um, encapsulates our value system. It encapsulates uh, our life ways. It encapsulates everything about um, what was important for us to articulate in the relationship, in this sort of futurity thinking relationship um, of the AFM project. So thank you very much for, for listening. And we would love to open it up for questions and comments and conversation. Hi, hi. Yes, thank you, Wanda and Selena. Um, thanks for sharing your valuable, valuable wisdom and experiences. And it was uh, so nice to listen to both of you speak so eloquently about your knowledge. Um, so yeah, if people have questions, feel free to either jump in on video or raise a hand or type a question, question out on the chat. And then maybe I, okay, yeah, go ahead. My question is, is um, would you guys ever schedule this at another time? I just had something run over into this one and I'd love to listen to you guys talk and share your knowledge for sure. Sure, and I think it's being recorded. So I think we can. Even better, I'll watch, I'll just have to go back and watch it and then you guys won't have to deal with my stupid questions either. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Um, maybe I'll start with a question. Um, I really like this whole concept of narrative in design and I'm just wondering how can the U of M, specifically the Faculty of Architecture become a part of an indigenous narrative? Well, I'm curious, I, I, I know you have a few, um, um, because we, we've heard from the U of M a number of times and I feel like there's an emerging practice developing um, there and I know Manitoba has a very long and deep history and similar to Arizona very dense history and so I'm curious what's happening in at U of Manitoba that you guys are excited about right now I just want to kind of do a survey of what's already underway um, yeah well I am also part of the Indigenous Design and Planning Students Association um, I'm in the architecture master's first year of master's um, and we recently uh, released our published publication, um, Voices of the Land, and that got us really excited to share student voices and um, Indigenous voices. So that's something we're working on. And um, Edipsa is also working on um, creating some type of workshop over the summer for Indigenous youth to expose them to the design world and the architecture world. I think this is a really beautiful start because these are the two areas I would say that we overlap with. So Selena knows this, that we've created a number of um, publications or monographs. You know, I think part of the work that's so important is for all of us to share out, right? I think there are, you know, 10 different pathways that we can get to the, 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 the best outcomes. And I'm not sure there's a single way to do it. And I think all of us sharing out is really important. Um, but through youth empowerment, and Selena can attest to this, she's designed and um, leads some amazing youth empowerment, you know, about is, which is about growing the next generation, right? And I think, um, I don't know, Selena, if you wanted to share kind of what you're doing in, in that youth empowerment session. Yeah, for sure. Um, I guess uh, I'm a little bit of a overachiever in that area, but when I went back to do my graduate school, I still felt as though there was a missing piece to my communities. And uh, I am uh, Yaqui, but I'm also Chicana, so Mexican American. And I felt that I needed to connect to my local communities in the Phoenix vicinity. And I was actually asked by the Sagrado Galeria to you know, create a workshop about design because um, the person leading those initiatives had um, interact has been interacting with some development issues. We have a light rail coming down into that neighborhood. Um, South Phoenix has uh, historically been where a lot of people of color have been displaced over time um, through racist efforts and planning. And um, 
yeah, so it was a huge type of development coming in and he felt that his community was um, not prepared and there wasn't enough actual designers from that community and people of color in those conversations. So he asked me to just create like a design primer, share what design is, what are design disciplines to begin to create a wider awareness for you know, the, not only the community, but specifically youth for the next generation that is to come. And we've been lucky enough to be able to have enough, you know, networking and partnerships already existing in that community to easily tap into a lot of the youth groups that already exist that are doing work at different capacities and to help, you know, um, build their skill sets whether that's design or not, and show them how design can supplement all of their initiatives or um, put visions out there within each of, you know, whether it's wider community or their individual neighborhoods. Yeah, and I would just add to that, thank you so much for sharing, you know, this, this, the youth, I'm just looking at our budget for the Indigenous Design Collaborative. We're making a proposal to get funding and besides the youth and the sort of outward facing products, I think the most important thing right now is really just to bring the, the people who are practicing indigenous architecture back into the architecture schools. I think this is the, the piece that we cannot seem to afford to bring another faculty line. I'm working so hard to fundraise because I think it's about that. It's about two or three voices coming together at the same time. So I think that's a really a great next move if you guys can fundraise and um, bring, even if they're young, you know, in their, the fact that they're um, exploring these concepts of indigeneity is so, so critical. So Could I ask a, a question to all of the people on the call today? Because I, I produced the podcast Prairie Design Lab, which is, um, was sparked by the Faculty of Architecture at the University of Manitoba. And uh, the so-called master plan for the largest urban reserve in Canada was released last week uh, here in Winnipeg, 160 acres of completely undeveloped land. And so a lot of people have been thinking about it, including the people from the people from the Treaty One organization have really largely been spearheading this and they've been working to organize it. But uh, I'm trying to figure out the principles that need to come forward about indigenous principles that will shape the design of this, uh, of this urban reserve, because as it's laid out now in terms of the grand plan, is that it's, uh, you know, uh, housing, um, businesses, uh, recreational areas, but I don't quite know what uh, is the, the, the guiding principle, except that the land is now considered to be reserve land because it was awarded to the Treaty One people under the Treaty Land Entitlement Principle. And so this had been an old Air Force base and it's now uh, become uh, uh, like a blank slate uh, for which many things can be done or with which many things can be done. And I'm trying to figure out how to cover it on the podcast aside from just interviewing the, the there, there's an indigenous architect who is coordinating the Treaty One's perspective on things, but other perspectives around uh, an opportunity as grand as this. I'd be curious to know what you're thinking. Well, one of the most exciting movements that we often talk about is the indigenization of cities. And you know the Te Aronga principles that are coming out of New Zealand? They're uh, a Maori, uh, a set of value-based Maori outcome oriented or process oriented principles that are giving a new face to Auckland to different projects in Auckland and we took that as inspiration and now we're working with the city of Tempe which is one of the the valley cities in um, in and around Phoenix to bring that process that creates those principles to us to a city in Phoenix and so I suspect that I'm not sure if we could, uh, you know, reach into a, a bag and grab principles. You know, I think the closest thing would be the seven, uh, the seven grandfather teachings. I recently um, connected with a development group in Toronto that we're exploring using the, those principles to design an area of downtown Toronto. But I think it's really about the process. I feel like, you know, the person who is involved in engaging those communities locally is probably getting much more uh, localized um, 
direction from that indigenous community, the indigenous communities that they're they're connecting with, then you know, bringing some sort of generalized framework to the land. Yeah, so I, I would be curious, can I ask who the indigenous architect is that's working on that? His name is David Thomas. David he Thomas. trained at trained at University of Manitoba. Yeah, I know him. Yep. I guess it's a small world. <laughs> <laughs> There were 18 of us. Maybe there's a few more. I see Sean. Sean's face popping up. Hey, Wanda. How are you? I'm very well, you. I'm Thanks for your presentation. So did, just as a final comment, if any of you feel as if you want to contribute to the conversation about this 160-acre uh, opportunity and what we as a community, particularly what the Indigenous community, since it will be classified as reserved land, what should be done with that land and to whose benefit? And, you know, they're, they're talking about a budget potentially of $1.2 billion in terms of construction that's going to go on there. That's, it sounds like an incredible project. But I know Dave Thomas and um, his daughter is, he's, that's Cheyenne's father, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So I think that I trust that project that is in good hands between those two. <laughs> powerhouses but yeah if there's an opportunity to you know have a public commentary on it let us know we'd love to to offer feedback you know or to offer bring our thought thoughts to the project yeah wanda i was just like some of the stuff that we've been working on in selena is uh you know, trying to have like I run a series of design studios and we're trying to really engage the communities and all of that. And so currently we're working um, on a studio looking at addressing indigenous homelessness. And so we've um, kind of worked with the street family, um, some grassroots initiatives and also a, a, knowledge, a knowledge keeper. And it's been really nice. And what, what this what this has done is it sort of created a conversation in the public a little bit. And so now because of it, what's happened is that they realize that this is a, a, a good positive story. And so the city actually just purchased um, land for a tiny homes community, which we will be able to take part in it. And so it's just like by involving those communities and involving the people, you get the story across and you start it just starts like blossoming into this really nice conversation. And so Sholik today, we worked with Sholik 40 doing uh, one of the design studios was to do a powwow arbor. And they were forced to have powwows in isolation. And you know, so they, they were sharing to the students all these amazing like horrific stories. And so one of the studio projects addressing this issue and so they actually chose one of the designs and today they just received their construction drawing. So now they have a Apollo grounds, a brand new one. So it's just working with the communities to make changes. What I find is the most impactful. Yeah. Yeah. And you're absolutely right. You know, the more we bring this out into the public arena, the more we get champions and ambassadors that join and, and begin to bring their thought leadership. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, okay, we have a question for Wanda here. Um, Wanda, since you're familiar with how both the Canadian and American Indigenous situation, um, can you speak to some of the differences and how we can learn from one another to decolonize our architecture, pedagogies, design, and history? That's a great question. You know, it's interesting. I've been in the U.S. about 10 years now, and to be quite honest, um, I feel like this, the, the situations that you find on our reserves and our reservations, almost identical, you know, same, all, yeah, every, I don't have to repeat it here, everyone knows, everyone's familiar, been to the res, um, very much the same, but I think what's happening um, in Canada that is very different from the US, you know, our policy of multiculturalism in Canada, I feel like the policy in the US is a little bit different and they talk about the melting pot. And I think there's this um, push to really sort of, you know, stir it up and kind of um, not distinguish between the cultures. And I find that having a Canadian perspective, which is about, you know, I remember heritage days in Edmonton where, 
where um, we used to go every year and you would learn about all the different cultures that live in our city. This policy of multiculturalism makes a huge impact to, I think, the Canadian worldview. And I think there's honestly a more, um, there's, a, I find a little, it's a little harder down here in terms of the acceptance of diversity and culture. And I think um, coming from a Canadian sort of multiculturalism uh, mindset has actually helped um, open open arenas because I think I came down here as a bit of an anomaly thinking, you know, all the cultures are great and why aren't we, you know, why is there just symbols on the highway? Why don't we have buildings and why don't we have, you know, um, um, architectures and, and, and events and ceremonies and why isn't it so much more out there? So I would say, unfortunately, it's the same, but I think um, Canada offers a, a really beautiful perspective in terms of the philosophy of looking at this work. Yeah, and but I guess in the in the in the plus side, um, I must seem really um, proactive or pro I don't want to say progressive; it's not the right word, but really forceful in kind of pushing culture because I come from Canada and I believe we should be celebrating diversity and culture. And so I think I might be looked at a bit of an anomaly here and it's maybe why the IDC has gotten the attention that it has is that we are pushing culture without regard for policy or history or things that might um, react against that. Great, thank you, Wanda. Um, I saw Rihanna's hand go up earlier. I don't know if that was an accident or on purpose. So um, Rihanna, if you have a question, feel free to ask. Um, if not, we have another question in the chat here. Uh, I was just gonna respond to Mary in regards to um, the Cabillon Rarick. So in my view, I see it more of a uh, representation of, I guess, economic uh, autonomy of First Nations people of Treaty One, I, in the form of that, it embodies the the built environment out of that as well. So I see us being able to self-govern our own land and use it for um, through the built environment and be and allow us to thrive through the economics that come out from that from that's this huge project and. Um, and it's a huge stepping point in us controlling our own land and controlling um, how we want to, um, how we want that outcome to be, to be, um, how we want that outcome to be, to be felt and how we want the voices of those seven communities to be, um, to be represented and the histories behind each of those seven um, communities as well. Um, I wrote it differently because I was trying to type it at the same time, but um, that was just a couple comments that I wanted to have in regards to that topic. Thank you, Rena, for mentioning that. It's hard, you know, we come from the outside. So having that local understanding is yeah, critical, really critical. Yeah. And we have a question here that could maybe be for everybody here today. Um, does anyone know of any work happening in the federal government that provide a lot of funding for building out native communities? Um, I feel like that we may have or want to integrate indigenous design, but it always seems to be put on the back burner and practicality always seems to come first. If anyone has any comments to that. and have authority and that's the indigenous housing what is it ihii indigenous housing initiative there's a few of us i think sean is one of the mentors in that program where they've awarded 24 different communities um, a, a small um, a seed fund in order to be able to ideate what their housing should be right we know it's a bit of failure right across canada from east to west and if we gave um, the local community's authority, what would they do different? And so I'm working with two different communities. I think Sean has one or two different communities. And I think through those programs, you know, which is basically giving um, power back to a more local um, group, those are, that's one of the strongest programs I've seen in a, in a long time. And I wish every government out there would, would um, help 
and act, do the same to act, to bring that sort of agency back. 